than me. And Andy, uh, and for those that, uh, again, don't know, um, phenomenal guy, uh, really wicked smart. And uh, we were in the um, working on some of the things that uh, were 400 gig. And he showed me some of the interesting things that are happening from a 400 gig perspective, which I will show you down here. Um, uh, so what we're doing is we're taking 400 gig to the next level. And that 400 gig is people may or may not know is more around taking the chipsets, what we call a CERTI. So basically serialization, deserialization method. We went from 10 gig which gave us 40 gig to 25 gig, which gave us four lanes of 400 gig. And then we went to 400 gig and we went to eight lanes of 50 gig. Um, so that gave us 400 gigs, of course, some breakouts. Now the challenge with 400 gig though, is if you want to have a switch that goes to 25 gig or 10 gig or something like that, because you were the 50 gig 30s, it's a 50 gig lane, right? So it's built for a certain lane. You then have to put some of the clocking techniques on there in order for you to downrate that. And that's what we call a gearbox. So this is eight lanes of 50 gig PAM4 in order to get to 400 gig. Now when we get to 800 gig, we're gonna take this 50 gig 30s, we're gonna double it again. So we're, we've got this PAM4 functionality, which is actually taking the eight lanes and mushing those together to give us the 400 gig. We're gonna do that same thing with this next generation chipsets that, uh, that are gonna come out here towards the end of the next year. We do have this at, in the labs today. So 400 gig is the new norm. Uh, and it, what you think about 400 gig is, well, it's gonna be four times the cost of 100 gig. And that's not the truth. Because it is a single die, it's almost the cost of twice that of 100 gig. So the cost of the chip is about twice and the cost of the transceiver is about cost that twice uh, twice the cost. So that gives us that economy to scale without having a you know four times price point. So we're looking at the different ways that we can do this too, is taking that 400 gigs. And even though we have this kind of a short reach or even some of the long reach, we're just taking, you know, eight lanes, which means you're doing an MTP cable. And we've all seen the MTP cables uh, with the MTP 12 connectors. And you see, look at that and you've got 12 connections, but there are QSFPs out there that take this and modulate this down. We're using the same techniques that we've done, we've done with DWM, waveform monitoring, and we're putting those on different wavelengths. So this gives us now ability to go back to a pair of fibers, like an SR fiber or an LC fiber, if you will, for a long range. It's mostly going to be long range these days. And then getting back to our cable plant. So where we had 100 gig and, and a pair of fibers, now we can go to 400 gig and a pair of fibers by doing this modulation. And you think about that where you remember back in the day we had, um, oh, hang on just a second. That's Andy. That was Andy B saying he's going to join right now. So he'll take over here. And so I'm just kind of filling in. So if you look at where we're going with this, uh, you know, from a WDM perspective, remember we had a special MUX just for wave for monitoring, right? For CWDM and DWDM. We're building those into the dies of the transceivers themselves. Transceivers themselves. Transceivers get a little bit longer. And because of all the little ASICs on there, they run hotter. So there's two different form factors of QSFPs for 400 gig and for 800 gig as well. You'll hear this thing called an OSFP and a QSFP DD. And so the QSFP DD gives us that ability to do the same form factor as your existing QSFP, stretch it out a bit, put like, uh, you know, like motorcycles has these little f uh, fans on them. It's basically a little, basically a heat sink on the transceiver. And that's the same size and same density now that you can get with the 100 gig for 400 gig and the next generation 800 gig. So using that same QSFP size, so QSFP DD, QSFP used to mean QSFP meant four, but the QSFP DD is the double density. That's where we get the eight. So you're going to see, you'll see 32 ports of 400 gig on a single switch. Now, why 32 ports? Well, because the chips were built that way, because that's the real estate available on the switch itself. So if you go beyond that, then you can, you know, actually get heating issues, but you also have the density of just the QSFP side by side. Now, what's happening from a growth perspective is we're taking this and doing interesting things with this.
So we'll do an, another interesting thing. We'll, we'll take a 400 gig and we'll break this out to two by 200 using these LC connections. So now we're taking these form factors where we said, oh, we can do a breakout into four by tens or four by 25s or taking a 400 gig and do four, 100 gigs is we're going to take this and say, oh, two, 200 gigs. And there are a lot of new NICs coming out, uh, like from Melox and others that are taking advantage of 200 gig. So 100 gig is the new is the new norm now. 200 gigs is the new norm really coming out this um, this right now. This is what they're using for high speed storage and things. So using these transceivers that are 400 gig, think about that 32 ports. Now I can get 64 ports of 200 gig in a one RU switch. So the densities are getting higher and higher and higher. Now, the breakouts are interesting about this because you now are looking at this from a waveform monitoring perspective is breaking out each one of those lanes into individual 100s. But watch the fact that, you know, if you want to get down to 25 gig speeds or 10 gig speeds, stay away from a 400 gig switch, at least for now. OK, so there, there is a lot of this happening now. I want to get to this one other area that we're getting into, um, which is uh, our interconnects for DCI. So DCI is great for this type of fun functionality because now you've got this waveform monitoring that's built into the transceiver itself. But that's just 400 gig. What if I want to do more? Well, we're coming out with this DWDM functionality in and basically in steroids so you can take a switch and let me get to actually what this looks like take all those 400 gig links all those 400 gig links and bring it into this thing called an osfp ls basically it's a line side system so this is a dwdm mux built into the size of an osfp transceiver that goes right into the switch so think about that now you've got four times eight 32, 3.2 3 terabits that can go across a single pair of fiber long haul. So if you have a multi-site facility, you know, that's going to do something like this with, and have the ability to have redundancy and have enough bandwidth, you have now the ability to do this with the new transceivers that are coming out. And all this is, is just a transceiver taking this particular power. This is actually not taking the transceiver and actually taking that as a interface itself. It's just basically becoming a MUX. So think about that. Now you're not restricted. Bandwidth is no longer an issue. Um, and this is one of the, the things that we're doing from an industry perspective is we're taking what 400 gig allows us to do to the next level. So this is not to be the sales pitch to be, you know, for Rista, but this is really to talk about technology and where is bandwidth and how much do I need for a switch to get these higher bandwidth things. Hey, Andy, are you, are you on yet? Have you joined? Nope. Okay. I, I, I haven't seen him yet. Um, he knows how to do this, right? He, yeah, I gave him the direct link. So uh, there you go. Okay. So the 400 gig ZR transceiver plus the OSFP line system and basically just this little mux. Uh, cable, which really just taking those the, the, those light and then dampering it a bit and putting it into allows you then to do interesting things, right? So now we don't have to worry about, for example, spine leaf environments. Well, you can have a single switch out here that is basically is, is a leaf, um, and that has all these 100 gig links, and you've got 3.2 terabits that goes up to a spine, if you will. Right. And so this this becomes now a whole interesting dynamic about which do I choose a monolithic switch or distributed spine leaf environment. So those are the types of things to think about. The other type of things to think about is what is my density going to be on my switch? Do I need to have 40 gig in here? Do I need to do breakouts of four by 10? What's the right switch form factor for me? And this is probably the hardest conversation to be had. Right. I want the 400 gig. Maybe that's a spine. Maybe I want to have some 400 gig in a leaf, you know, but do I need to have this 25 gig, 10 gig type of functionality at the edge? And so that gives us that ability to do that. But if we, again, back to the form factors, you can see this OSFP, which has this functionality of the uh, phase up with the QSF PDD. You, we can do, you know, we can do interesting things in this here where we couldn't do it here. And this is, this is where we're going from an industry perspective is you'll see this dichotomy of each one of these. And, you know, there's the preference for one with one manufacturer preference for the other, but just note that these are interoperable number one, but they are different sizes. Okay. So the OSFP is a little bit bigger than the QSF PDD. QSFP is the same size as a standard QSFP, 40 gig, 100 gig. And then the OSFP is a little bit bigger. Okay. So, um, and this is forward compatible with the 800 gig. 
So size wise, you know, it's going to see, you're going to see this and this, you'll see both of these for a while. And until things shake out, um, you know, you'll, you'll have to, you know, consider which one of these to use. Um, so DWDM wise, definitely do that. You can have that as a solution. Um, you can you can look at this as a bigger, better, faster functionality for 800 gig. You can look at where things are going uh, from a transceiver perspective. And we're going to do a lot more um, longer distance. We're working on 400 gig that goes below, uh, well uh, past 10 kilometers. So 100 kilometers, you know, is something that we're working on right now. So think about 100 kilometers, you can go across pretty much, you know, the entire US with multiple links. Uh, you could do, you know, the 3.2 terabits as well, type of functionality built into this. And so there's a lot of interesting things that you could build with just having bandwidth. Okay, so all the different switches that are coming out. Um, so you'll we have this coherence, uh, and that's the old way of doing things. The new QSF PDD and OSFP are the new way of doing it. Um, you can do it cheaper, better, faster, and with a more resilient env environment. Um, the, the standard QSFP, I'm sorry, the uh, coherent optic is tunable, um, whereas these other ones aren't tunable yet. We're working on doing 400 gig for tunable. That'll be coming out as well. A lot of innovation happening. So a transceiver right now is going to morph, morph into like the same thing we did with 10 gig we're going to do that we didn't do with 40 gig which is like doing tunable transceivers we're going to be doing with 400 gig okay similar to what the coherent did as well hey andy have you joined no he's going to leave me high and dry um so <laughs> you can you can have him give me a call if you if he needs some help getting on um, I, I gave him the direct link to uh, to log in here. So hopefully he's going to be doing that uh, momentarily. Um, the one thing to note here, and this is one of those topics that comes up quite a bit. Um, a, we call them DACs, direct attached cables. Um, a DAC cable is, is, a, um, is a copper connection. It's also the least expensive connection in terms of, you know, cost of transceivers and cost of infrastructure. But what ends up happening is you get these higher data rates, even at 100 gig. You don't, don't go more than three meters with a 100 gig DAC. It starts to break down. But if you think about going off the motherboard, if you will, of the chassis itself or of the switch itself, you're electrical. If you're doing a transceiver, you're going electrical to optical to electrical. Well, with a DAC cable, you're going electrical to electrical to electrical. So it is more efficient, the wattage is down, the heat is down, but the signal breaks down with copper. Okay, so you want to think about what is the right type of cabling for you. And cabling infrastructure sometimes is the hardest thing to talk about, especially if you're a system integrator, right? And Or if you need to qualify these because you're a manufacturer, I need to qualify different things. Note that in 400 gig, you probably don't want to go more than two meters. And the other interesting things with a DAC cable, it's a fairly thick cable, unlike fiber, where you can coil it up and stick it in a brush plate, that cables have a bend radius of about six inches. So if you're gonna have a switch that's pretty much against the door that needs to close, note that you have to accommodate those larger bend radius. Again, you're gonna save money, but you have to accommodate bend radius. So what I recommend is something called an active optical cable, we call them AOCs. It comes with a fixed connection at a certain rate and you plug those in and you've got a fiber connection. So this now gives you that economies of scale that you got from a sales, uh, from a uh, uh, performance perspective, but also from a cost perspective as well. And there's Mr. Bechelshine. Uh, Andy, you just need to tilt your camera down just a little bit. I will stop sharing and we'll get to Mr. Bechelshine, who was actually the star of the show. And hopefully you can stick around for just a little bit longer while uh, we just change um, presentation people here. So Andy, thank you so much. Sorry for the mix up on timing. Hopefully for everybody, you'll stick around. Andy is not only one of the smartest guys I know uh, and most kindest guys I know, he is working on some of the most interesting things I've ever seen done. And, and, and this is gonna revolutionize again, as he's done before, the networking industry. Yeah, I apologize for the time mix up. I was in a different time zone and somehow the uh, calendar uh, screwed up on the time zone change. Um, so uh, to, to jump right in here, uh, can I get to these slides? Just one second. Um, um, you know, for, for, for geek um, optics and, and cables and AOCs are shipping, I should say up front. Uh, they have been in qualification now for the last two years. They are uh, fully production 
worthy and um, 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 in, in production, basically. Um, and let me just see if I can get the slide up here. Uh, it should say something data in the ethernet. Yes. Yeah, so looking good. It is still ramping, um, meaning um, the industry shipped about a million ports uh, last calendar year. <clears throat> Expectation is about two, two to three million ports this year. Uh, and then you see on the lower right, uh, there's already the 800 gig coming in. And I'll, I'll mention that in a second. Um, but the fundamental thing that's going on here is that the underlying silicon, which is the switch chips that uh, otherwise known as merchant silicon, the, the chips that Broadcom and Intel and other people make, uh, are improving the speed of the electrical signals coming out of the chip, which is the prior generation was running at 25 gig per channel. So a hundred gigabit uh, um, optics was actually four by 25. The current generation of chips is at 50 gigabit per channel, which is kind of an odd number because not too many people use a 50 gig optics, uh, but it's used for 400 gig as eight channels of 50 gig makes 400. The next generation of chips coming out starting next year uh, use 100 gig electrical per channel. So each lane coming out of a chip is 100 gig ethernet, four lanes is 400 gig and eight lanes makes 800 gig. Um, and this transition will happen uh, basically on all future silicon that's not, it, we have some in the lab already, but all the new silicon coming out going forward will use these 100 gig channels if I can switch to the next slide here. And, um, uh, and that's true for the next, I don't know, 10 years, let's just say it. So there's some analyst forecasts, which um, I hope to get to in a second here, where you look at the dark purple or the dark blue uh, thing uh, is the projection for the bandwidth delivered in 100 gig channels compared to the yellow, which was 50 gig and the gray, which is 25 gig. And as you can see, at least the forecast is that by 2023, the bandwidth shipped through 100 gig channels exceeds the entire Ethernet market for next year. So it's a very rapid transition. <clears throat> and primarily it's because it's, it's cheaper, meaning um, when you, you get higher density if you can get the IO faster. And for the cloud, which is the early adopter for all this, um, you know, it, um, uh, it's um, time. So what this really means is that, sorry, uh, that the optics that work the best with the 100 gig channels are things that um, use 100 gig Lambda. So that's one laser for every 100 gigabit. So 100 gig optics in the future called 100 gig DR or ER is just one laser instead of four lasers today. A 400 gig of course is already 100 gig Lambda. So that would be four channels and 800 gig optics would be eight of these channels. And uh, I think Robert went through all the various uh, combinations of uh, these things, but uh, let me just highlight them again. So on the 100 gig side, uh, people are working on everything from BIDI, ER, LR, DR, SR, all single laser 100 gig per channel. On the 400 gig side, uh, these things are essentially shipping, except today they're in a eight by 50 gig electrical module, but they're coming out 100 gig Lambda optically, right? So there is um, um, DR4, which is the parallel version, FR4, duplex, LR4, the 10 kilometer version. ER4 has been um, not yet ratified and it may be 30 kilometers instead of 40, but it's essentially a, a, a denser spacing of the wavelength in the uh, uh, avalanche photo detector to increase the sensitivity, but that will be available. And then on the 800 gig side, I mean, this sounds advanced, but the 800 gig modules are really just two 400 gig in one package for density reasons. Uh, the most popular ones will be the uh, dual 400 gig. So that's the, the one, like the third one from the bottom, um, the dual duplex, which is essentially two times 400 gig FR4 and one 800 gig module and the 800 gig DR8, which is eight channels of 100 gig in the module. Um, and the reason people are uh, fascinated by these 800 gig modules is they promise to be lower cost per bit than two 400 gig modules. So even though they have the same uh, bandwidth as 240 gig module, the uh, current expectation is that there will be 25 to 30 percent lower cost per bit, and that's because there's a single DSP chip in an 800 gig module, whereas in a 400 gig module, there's each one has a DSP chip, and the DSP chip is the most expensive part of the module. Um, now, uh, many of these will be used in a breakout application mode. So for example, even today, 400 gig DR4 
uh, can easily be split up into four individual 100 gig DRs. Now notice these are DR, not uh, 400 gig CWM4. So it has to be the single channel 100 gig optics. And there's tiny little connectors known as SN or MDC connectors that allow these to be connectorized individually. So they're point-to-point -point links coming into the module without having to do a splitter cable. Um, another thing I was gonna mention is uh, the newer 400 gig modules have enabled a backwards compatibility mode, otherwise known as uh, multi-speed optics. So they, they actually have the same wavelength grid as say a 200 gig FR4 or even 100 gig CWM4. And the latest version of the 400 gig FRM4 modules can be uh, reprogrammed in software to support lower speeds at the optical level, meaning you can actually plug in a 400 gig module and talk to 100 gig CWM4 because you're wasting 75% of the speed, but it does allow to upgrade one, of, one set of the link before the other one. Um, but again, the, the reason people are fascinated by Ethernet gig, and you, you see a lot of announcements of this at the OFC uh, optical uh, fiber uh, communication show that's in two weeks, is that they're just expected to be much lower cost. And they also will be cheaper at the system level. And of course, they're fully optically compatible with the 400 gig optics that exist today. So to highlight what a future uh, switch could look like with uh, 51.2T bandwidth. So this is a product that we would expect to see in 2023, roughly two years from now. You can actually build such a switch with two U chassis, 64 800 gig plugs, which then of course can support 128 400 gig plugs uh, or um, uh, up to 512 uh, 100 gig uh, circuits. And uh, one last thing about this is a lot of people like their LC connectors. So the, the OSFP in particular supports a dual LC configuration where each of the uh, 400 gig FR4s can come out as a dedicated uh, FR4 circuit. So I, I know we realize, I realize we're out of time and I don't wanna uh, script the schedule here any further, but I, let me just mention uh, Ethernet gig Ethernet uh, is also coming. The spec for Ethernet gig Ethernet is actually uh, done uh, as of April last year. There's a consortium called the Ethernet Technology Alliance that we're a member of and so is Cisco and Microsoft and Broadcom and so on. So that spec is going to all the next silicon, like the 51.2T silicon, to uh, offer full 800 gig uh, channels. And with an 800 gig channel, you can actually do, I think, 64 12 gigabit um, 4K resolution video streams all over just one pipe, which is amazing. And then finally, last but not least, there also will be 800 gig ZR optics in this time frame, which are the uh, coherent wavelength optics. So in a single channel, 800 gig, uh, you can carry the same bandwidth. And, and obviously the products, uh, the system products that support this are all expected in 2023. So I think I will leave it at this and I can apologize for mixing up my, my calendar here. Um, uh, but uh, last message is 100 gig Lambda is the way to go because it is gonna be low cost for a bit, a 10 year life cycle, and it will be backwards compatible to 100 gig plugs and 400 gig plugs and 800 gig plugs. So even though the 25 gig Lambda has served the industry in very high volume for the last five years, the 100 gig Lambda is definitely the anchor, anchor point for the next 10 years. And that's all the slides I had. And I apologize for running late again. So, so 100 gig and beyond. I mean, it's it's almost like a, I'd say to say like a Disney, you know, cartoon. It's like 100 gig, 400 gig, and then right on. But if you look at the rate of change uh, over time, and Andy, this is this is uh, actually a tribute to you. You took the 10 gig to 25 gig, and then 25 gig to 40 gig, and then the 40 gig was like the norm for a short period of time, and then 100 gig came in right after that. Yeah. So it seems like just it's going faster and faster. But if I can say one more thing here, when the optics obviously have a very long life cycle, not that they they're just the standards are long levity, longevity, but because the optics don't go bad. If you're buying optics today, they're going to work in five years and maybe even 10 years from now, right? So you want to pick the optics that are forwards compatible for the literally the next 10 years. And and even though again, 100 gig CWM for the 25 gig lambda has, has been and still is the mainstay of the industry, the 100 gig lambda ones are the ones that are fully compatible going forward. Okay. And with this, I, again, I apologize. I have to jump on another call right now, but uh, that was what I had to share with you today. Andy, thank you very much. Very honored to have you uh, join our, our group here. Um, it, it's really, uh, it's really uh, very nice of you to, to do that. And um, hopefully we'll uh, be able to entice you back for uh, you know, talking about uh, 
yeah, the ongoing work that you're doing. So really well, appreciate that. On time next time. Okay, thank you. Bye bye. All right, take care. Thanks, Eddie. So, uh, Robert, uh, do you want to uh, throw in any closing comments? Uh, you're the last speaker today, so we don't have anybody. Uh, we're not stepping uh, on anybody um, else's schedule. As you can tell, we're passionate about what we do, and uh, as as all of you are, and everybody who's left, all sixty nine of you, we 